Hello to everybody out there. Hello, hello. How are you all? Everybody doing all right? Well, that's good to hear, and thank you so much for coming to this afternoon's session. Um, welcome to the 2013 Festival of Faiths with the title you know, Sacred Silence, Pathway to Compassion. We are so pleased. I can hardly, I mean, it's just hard to believe. The whole thing is really like a dream that we have had program after program of the most inspiring uh, kinds of sessions. I, I don't even want to call them talks because they've just been these experiences uh, that have been uh, deeply uh, helpful is the word that I think of and, and very um, profound on many levels. So thank you all for uh, being a part of it. And of course, thanks so much to our speakers, our distinguished speakers who have really come from all over the world to be here, right here in Louisville, Kentucky which um, feels somehow all very natural and appropriate and just right. But uh, a huge thanks to them for uh, coming this long way. And many of you in the audience have come from uh, far, far away, uh, including my dear mother-in-law, who's just arrived from Argentina and, and other Argentines and, just, and Swedes and uh, one from Hong Kong coming. So anyway, it's just fabulous to be with you all. Um, as you know, to put on an event like this, requires a lot of help, and it would just uh, be impossible not to thank those that are so involved, including our office, uh, led by Dr. Kathleen Lyons and um, Sarah Reed Harris and Chris Wooten. We've also received huge support from the community uh, at large. Uh, as many of you know, uh, this particular festival is being put on at the request of the mayor who was with us this morning and has been with us for uh, many of the sessions and has his own session coming up on, uh, well, tomorrow night, actually. And, um, and all of it is, is completely uh, uh, connected in, the, in as much as his session is very much uh, inspired by uh, all of the sessions that have happened thus far. So please uh, come join us tomorrow night if you can. And for any of the other sessions we have ahead of us, uh, all of which are listed in our program. Um, We've also uh, received big support, and it's just quick, quick for us to mention uh, Brown Foreman Corporation, uh, the uh, Archdiocese of Louisville, uh, the Earth and Spirit Center, the Muhammad Ali Center, Louisville Public Media, uh, Drapon Gomong Institute, which is the host organization for the Dalai Lama visit, which is starting Sunday afternoon, the Thomas Merton Center, Fons Vitae, thank you, Gray, uh, Compassionate Louisville, which is having its own series of events going on right now parallel to these which is also very exciting, the Idea Festival, Val Jones and the Whiskey Row Lofts, and also Christy Brown. Um, lastly, I'll just mention, uh, a well, two things. Uh, one is there is a flyer that um, I have been, I think, inaccurately attributing to one single individual. It turns out, not surprisingly, that this great uh, flyer is, a, is, a, is the work of a whole lot of individuals, and there's a note that I haven't quite, I don't have on me to reference exactly who, but if you're among us, you know how great a gift it is that you've given us, which is a sheet talking about meditation opportunities and contemplative practices in Louisville, and it's uh, listed in, in various ways, including by way of uh, traditions, Buddhist, Christian, interreligious, non-denominational, and they're out uh, in the hall along with all the other goodies. Please take one of these if it's of interest to you. Um, Lastly, I'll just talk about the form. We're going to, um, before we introduce our speakers, which Gray will do, um, we will, uh, after you introduce the speakers, I will be the timekeeper for a, uh, a session of silence. And then, Rajiv, I think you've agreed at the end to, uh, and I'll place the, uh, the gong. Uh, and so maybe when you hear uh, the, the gong, you can um, all help me in welcoming our, our guests to the stage at the end of the uh, silent session that we'll start with now. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, I am honored to introduce to you my co-programmer and dear friend, Gray Henry. We're very, very, very fortunate to have Dr. Seydou Sein Nasser with us this afternoon. I mean, he's, we've tried for so many years to have him back. He came when we did the Merton and Sufism Congress many years ago. He was one of our major speakers. But the monks at Gethsemane, the Cathedral Heritage Foundation, we've been trying to bring him back to his Kentucky home for a long time, uh, beginning in Iran, where he headed the Imperial Academy of Philosophy and Science, 
Having studied at Harvard, he then finally returned to America where he teaches at George Washington University. Uh, he's one of the greatest uh, scholars uh, of Islamic spirituality and Islam in general in the world today, and we are supremely grateful to have his company. Also today we have, uh, we have Swami Atma Rupananda, I pronounced it correctly, who's come all the way from Calcutta, where he resides in a, in a monastery devoted to Ramakrishna. Um, he's discovered the Vedanta tradition of Hinduism as a student in Sweden and joined the Ramakrishna order at the age of 19 and later spent many years in India, engaged in monastic scholarly and spiritual training where he lives today. He's a founding member of the Spiritual Alliance convened by the Global Peace Initiative for Women and a participant in its ongoing Sufi Yogi and Hindu-Buddhist dialogues. Um, also, we will have on stage with us uh, the moderator, Rajiv Mehra. I am, I'm forgetting how to pronounce your name, Rajiv. Let me give it a try. Hmm? Mehrotra. Um, my goodness. Let's just say he is a disciple of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And when the Dalai Lama received his Nobel Prize funds, he gave them to Rajiv to set up the Institute for Human Responsibility. Rajiv is also a filmmaker and the head of an incredible filmmaking um, situation in Delhi where he makes uh, programs and interviews some of the greatest spiritual masters uh, alive and not alive. And we are very fortunate to have him as a moderator today. Thank you very much.
Please join me in welcoming our speakers to the stage. Could I invite Swami Atma Swarupananda to speak? Dr. Nasri. In the name of God, the one, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I begin with the traditional Muslim prayer for the opening of all things, a prayer that precisely emanates from the silent one and returns unto him. Uh, apparently, we're going to each speak about 40 minutes, after which we'll have a discourse with each other, and then there'll be questions and answers also from the audience. A few words that I shall say are based on the Islamic perspective and within Islamic perspective on Sufism. Uh, they're not personal r ruminations. They're based on a long tradition of understanding uh, the relation between silence and compassion, which is based on the analysis of the levels of the self, of who we are and where we come from and where we're going. I want to first of all make clear, there are some things I have to make clear. There's been too much discussion in many circles in the West about, let's say, Christianity and Sufism, Buddhism and Sufism, and so forth. This is not correct. Buddh uh, uh, Sufism is, a, is an aspect of Islam. It's like saying a uh, comparison between Islam and uh, Trappist monks. Uh, Trappist monks are part of Catholicism, Catholicism is part of Christianity. and. Uh, Sufism is the inner spiritual contemplative dimension of the Islamic religion. And the same for the Vedanta. As uh, everybody loves the Vedanta, nobody loves to study the laws of Manu, but Vedanta is part of Hinduism. And to do it justice, one has to understand in the context of the great tradition that Hinduism is. But that's not my responsibility to discuss. The other one is. As far as these two perspectives are concerned, which is the subject of this uh, afternoon session, that is a Sufism and the Vedanta. Each represents the interior esoteric dimension of the two great religions that met side by side in the subcontinent of India from the seventh, eighth Christian century onward. That is Hinduism and Islam. And uh, through the centuries that followed, there was a remarkable reciprocity of uh, presence of discourse, of exchange between the highest representatives of the two traditions. No one has as yet written fully about the interaction between uh, the Vedanta and Sufism over the centuries. But just to give you one small example, uh, the West would not have known about the Vedanta and the Upanishads had it not been for the translation of the Upanishads by a Sufi who was also a prince, Dara Shuku, into Persian. It was this translation I was later translated into Latin by Anquetu du Perron and presented to Napoleon in 1804 and found its way to Europe and started all the interest in Hinduism. Uh, very, very few people know that. There's a, remark there's a remarkable chapter of the spiritual history of humanity, the exchange between uh, Sufism and uh, the Vedanta. Of course, that's not going to be the subject for my brief discourse. It's a long, long story, but I thought you should at least know about it. For centuries, great sages have sat from different two, the two traditions and carried that discourse together. But since the subject of this conference was uh, silence, 
Now, I'm forced to tell you a personal account. I hardly ever do so when I give a lecture, but I shall do so now. In 1973, I went to Madras, where the International Congress of Philosophy was being held in India. And I was to give a major philosophical address, but I knew that the greatest living authority of the Vedanta, the Shankaracharya of Kanchipuram, the old Shankaracharya, uh, was living in Kanchi near uh, Madras. So I asked Professor Mahadevan, the great uh, Indian philosopher who was a disciple, to arrange for me to see him. And he, uh, he accepted. He arranged for me to go and see him. And I, I went to a garden about 50, 60 kilometers away from Madras. And uh, I was wearing complete traditional Islamic dress. And they put me in this beautiful garden on a Persian carpet. And I sat cross-legged waiting for some time. And after a while, the Shankaracharya came in with the staff in his hand of a sannyasin, which was never was put on the ground, with two eyes that were more brilliant than the sun. And of course, I being a Malekha, not being a Hindu, he could not come close to me. And I respect that, of course, very much. I'm a traditional Orthodox person, and I'm not a 19th century modernist in, in, in any form of whatsoever. Uh, and I respected that very much. I was not offended. I was very happy. But he came as close as he could. And he sat down like the Hindu said, do without his back touching the ground, but just sitting on the ground, which most Westerners could not do for more than 30 seconds without falling down the ground or hurting their knees. Don't try it. But they can sit for hours doing this. He sat like this, and a man came from him, and he said, His, uh, the Shankara is observing the fast of silence. He will only speak to you in silence. So for about eight minutes, eight minutes, he and I just looked into each other's eyes. I've had many, many uh, religious discourses with popes and bishops and rabbis and uh, great Buddhist Zen masters, you, you name it. Uh, 50 years I've been doing this. This was perhaps the most profound religious discourse I've, I've ever experienced. After the eight minutes were over, he made some sign language to the person and the person came to me and he said, the Shankara is so happy that the deepest truths of the Vedanta are confirmed by the deepest truth of Sufism. And that, that is what silence really means. But on that level, to practice silence is not an easy thing. And uh, if I can maybe a little bit critical of ourselves, I must mention that to talk about silence in relation to spirituality, because we must not only think about sound, you must think of the clutter that goes on inside us, both the power of the mind, that is, concepts that come one after another, and the power of images in our imaginal faculty. There are two different noise systems within us. One is images that come and go, and one is thoughts that come and go. And we have no control over them. And you have to be a great saint to be able to quiet them down. All of the techniques and methods of all religions have for the ultimate end, I mean spiritual techniques, to bring about this inner silence. Silence doesn't only mean not speaking out. That's only a small part of it. It's this inner silence which is so difficult to attain. Now, this is the supreme goal of both Sufism and the Vedanta, obviously. If there's to be a comparison between the two, and I'm not going to make more comparative statements except this, uh, Usually, of course, in the Vedanta, other people just speak about Brahman, uh, the supreme metaphysics is based on the pure subject, Atman, the pure self. So the absolute reality is envisioned in terms of the pure subject. And in most Sufism, absolute reality is envisaged as the pure object. Now, the pure subject is ultimately nothing other than the pure object. The purely transcendent and the purely imminent are metaphysically the same. Perhaps no other modern writer has made that as clear as the late Friedrich Schuon, who's buried a few miles from here, who wrote one of the most incredible essays ever written in the European languages on the relationship between the Vedanta and Sufism, where he brings this issue out. So there's not a difference of two different metaphysics, different formulation of the same reality. That is, either we are attached to the ultimately that which is beyond ourselves or that which is ultimately ourselves in the deepest sense. But both imply a beyondness. Both imply a beyondness. And in order to come to that and understand that, we must understand the structure of the soul. 
my dear friend, Gray Henry, who's done so much for this city and for this conference, and she's my sister and the only person who can order me around in the world, uh, and no, no other person, uh, I'm here because of her. Uh, she asked me to speak about this question of the self, and so I thought I would dovetail uh, my analysis of the relationship between silence and compassion to this question of the self, because that is the key. That is the key, to realize beyondness, if I can use such a term in English, either of being completely beyond as other or completely beyond as same and self and inward. We have to understand what we have to go beyond. Why would we have to go beyond? What is it that we have to go beyond? Now, we begin, all of us, all of us human beings who have been given consciousness, we begin with uh, the self as uh, inner reality, experiential reality, the most direct. Uh, we are, identify ourselves with this particular bundle or sphere of impressions, thoughts, and so forth, which is myself. And unfortunately, in this stage of what the Hindus would call the Kali Yuga, in this stage of the dark period of history especially, we're almost born with complete imprisonment in this uh, state of selfishness, in the negative sense, not in the sense of Atman, but uh, the small self. And most of us live through a life like that. But because metaphysically speaking, the self is not a totally independent being, there's always a crack in its wall somewhere. There's always something beyond it. That's why selfishness does not bring happiness, ultimately. Because it is not ontologically independent, metaphysically speaking. It's not a being completely independent unto itself. No self can be happy by simply being itself, no matter how it tries to satisfy its appetites, which never end, which is another sign of the fact that it has in it an echo of the infinite. The fact that we as human beings are never happy with simply having more and more quantitatively, in contrast to a horse who eats its food and once it eats its food, it's happy. We, we, our, our appetites are not satiated because something of the infinite is reflected in our self, small self. Something of Atman is reflected in that self. So this self is there. And even for ordinary people, uh, we realize that sometimes when, uh, let's say, if we have gained a few pounds, we say, oh, I have to discipline myself. Who is being disciplined and who is disciplining? So we already realize the famous saying of St. Thomas Aquinas, duo sunt and omine, in Latin, there are two within us. There's not only one self, there is more than one self. And Sufism begins right here. Right here by pointing out that in fact we have many selves. Nafs in Arabic, nafs has many different meanings, but one of them is this, uh, self, ego. And they're like uh, sheaths, uh, they're like spheres, concentric spheres, one inside the other. We begin with the nafs, with the self, with the ego, that in classical Arabic is called al-mara bisu, that is, which commands us to evil. And what is evil but the privation of good, of the limited in place of the unlimited, and that's where the wrong choices come from, and therefore it is the ego which turns us away from the divine reality. It, uh, the divine reality is there. It's the dark glass that prevents the sun from to shining within our being. But there's, as I said, the first stage of perfection is the realization that this is not really us. So the first stage is the higher attainment of the self, which is called al-nafsul lawama in Arabic, which means the blaming soul, the soul that is able to blame itself. As soon as you say, I blame myself for having said this unkind word to my friend, that I in that sentence is not the same I that was blaming the friend, saying the unkind words. It's a an, it's an, an higher I within us that is able to blame itself. That's the first stage of spiritual profession, of going beyond the limitations of the human substance, the human ego, the human state, is the realization of uh, being able to blame ourselves, to see our own faults. And once we do that, 
gradually be tried to overcome these faults. Now, how this happens, I will not going to go into the question that is not simply a, a rationalistic ethics that we read a book of ethics and correct ourselves. The soul cannot be corrected without the grace of God, and to speak in Abrahamic terms, without religion, without tradition. And even in Buddhism, which does not have a theistic view of the divine reality, without the compassion of the Buddha. Why? Otherwise, it would be Buddhism without the Buddha. But there is no Buddhism without the Buddha. And certainly in Hinduism, it's emphasized as much as in the Abrahamic religion. So let me use our own Abrahamic terms. So our own, most of the people here come from Abrahamic families. We have, I know, Hindus and Buddhists and so forth. But anyway, let me use this language, which we all understand. Uh, this transformation cannot go, c take place by itself. There has to be what Christians would call grace. Muslims would call grace, baraka, faith, divine succor, divine help, without which even if we blame our, ourselves, we will not be able to cure ourselves from the blemishes that we have. That's a very, very difficult thing. Very, very difficult thing to do much more difficult than getting 10 PhDs in physics or uh, another subject the, from the best universities. Much more difficult. And uh, once we attain that, however, once we are able to heal those errors of the soul, the soul itself is transformed alchemically, like base metal into gold, into what is called nafsul mutmainna, that is the soul that rests in peace, that rests in divine peace. And this is the peace from which emanates compassion. This is the point where Islam and Buddhism also have a lot in common. Uh, you always have these images of the Buddha which have tremendous peace in them, I mean tra traditional images, whether it's Japanese or Sri Lankan from uh, Theravada or Mahayana or of course Vajrayana school in Tibet have the most beautiful images. There's always a remarkable element of peace, but combined with compassion. And compassion issues at this level of the soul. And once one reaches that, then one reaches the highest level, according to Sufism, which is nafthar radiyatan mardiyatan, as the Quran says, that is the soul that is both satisfied with God and God is satisfied with it. That is the highest attainment. The word satisfied here, reda, from which come so many Arabic names, like the word Reda, Mardiya, and, and so forth and so on, is a very profound virtue, to be able to be satisfied. We are dissatisfied human beings. We cannot be satisfied. We cannot go become satisfied unless we're able to, try to go through these steps of perfection to gradually attain the state beyond the limitations of the ego. The great mystery of the human state which all religions have uh, emphasized is that the human state needs something beyond itself in order to be human. To, de to deny the divine element in hu human beings is to live be below the human. And uh, Sufism emphasizes that Every religion emphasizes that, and Sufism so opens the door within Islam for not only talking about this, but also attaining it. Now, to attain that stage is to realize the truth that the Quran mentions when it says, verily, we created you from a single soul. Nafsun wahd. God says that we created all human beings from a single soul. But that, we are not aware of that usually. That is the origin of compassion. Compassion is not simply sentimentality. Uh, tomorrow when I speak, I'm going to talk about the relationship between compassion and truth, which we oftentimes negate and deny and neglect to, uh, at very great cost to humanity. I shall say something about that tomorrow. But let me just say here that compassion is not only sentimentality. It is that. It includes good sentiments. Good sentiments are fine. It's not just feel good by giving a dollar to some poor person in the street. It's much more profound than that. Compassion is to be true to ourselves. True to ourselves, to be our real self. Why? Because once we transcend all the limited levels of the self and attain the highest state of the self, we realize what the Quran said, that we're created from a single soul. Uh, that, in fact, myself is the self of all selves. So true charity is helping myself. 
No interest of hoarding all the wealth of others. That's to become imprisoned in that ego which I'm, we're trying to escape from. But to realize that to give is also to receive. That's what Christ said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because in giving, we realize ourselves much more than in receiving. And this is not at all sentiment. It's met pure metaphysics. It's a science. It's based on the reality that, first of all, ultimately all of us, in the deepest sense, are one soul. The Quran said, nafsun wahid, a single soul. Secondly, in helping others, in being charitable towards others, in showing compassion to others, we're being true to the only thing that is really true in us, that is the Supreme Self. The only thing that is really real in us, the only thing that's true in us, is the Supreme Self. Everything else is maya, is shadow, is half true, illusion, or whatever term you want to use. I don't it's in pure illusion. Maya is not pure illusion, it's also divine play, as Arana Kumaraswami said, but usually it's translated illusion. But anyway, it's not ultimate reality. The only thing that's ultimately real is the divine self in us. And so this compassion really is to be oneself and to be truly oneself, to be real. The only way we can be real is to be compassionate, in, a, in the deepest sense, metaphysical sense of the term. And we have to introduce this intellectual, spiritual element into something which appears to many people to be simple emotions. Even the emotions God has put in our heart because emotions also reflect deeper levels of our being. The fact that good people are charitable is not accidental. It's related to, the, to goodness. Because goodness is what takes us away from the confines of the ego, which uh, orders us to do evil, as we say, amara basu. Now, uh, <coughs> There are usually several ways of breaking the walls of the ego. God has provided different ways. That's why I have different forms of yoga in Hinduism, different uh, paths in Buddhism and Islam and Christianity. Some religions emphasize one more, some others. I don't want to get into it if you like compared to religion now. Judaism, for example, has a path of knowledge in the Kabbalah, which is much more accentuated that Christian path was mostly the path of love, but the path of love is not absent in Judaism, nor is the path of knowledge in Christianity, and so forth and so on. We could go down the line. Now, uh, just turning to Islam, but these are comments really uh, pertain to other religions as well. There are several ways that uh, we can come overcome the walls of the ego. And the first question, of course, that might come, why do we have to overcome walls of the ego? We have to overcome it because it suffocates us, because we suffer from it. The dukkha by which the Buddha speaks has to do precisely with this. If we could be happy in the prison of the ego, all religion would be useless. And in fact, nobody would have followed it over the millennia. Anything that has been followed over the millennia must have had some use, otherwise people wouldn't follow it. If honey didn't taste sweet, not every civilization would not have honey in one way or another in its diet. This is the same way. This is a very, very important point. So since we're not happy, we cannot be happy in this prison of the ego, our spirit is made for the infinite. It's made for the empyrean. It's not made for the bottom of a well. Since we're not happy, there's several ways in which this, the, this wall or borders of this limited ego, this limited existence in which most of us live can be removed. There's not only one. One is, of course, through pure knowledge. Pure knowledge, the path of the Vedanta, of which we have the equivalence in uh, Sufism. That is, sapiental knowledge burns through all of the limitations of existence and leads ultimately to the sun, which alone is. Not everyone, however, is gifted with, it, with this aptitude. Not everyone can follow the path of pure knowledge. There's then the path of love, the path of devotion. And this path of devotion is to go beyond our ego to give ourselves. And at, love means attachment. Love means attachment. 
whereas knowledge oftentimes implies detachment from some things. Love always means attachment. The object of love is what we're attached to. There's no such thing as detached love. There's no fire that does not burn. Now, this is a very, very important element. Some people would say the most important element of possible spiritual paths or the spiritual love of humanity, and that is the path of love, which is not only the love for God, but also the love for all that comes from God, which means all of his creation. And here in is to be found the real meaning of compassion. The word compassion in Latin comes from two words, come, which means together, pathos, from Greek pathos, which means uh, pain, pain originally, like pathology you have in medicine. But also it means elation of the soul, it means movement of the soul. And the deepest sense, compassion, means feeling the pains of others. In the deepest sense, that's the etymological, that's what the word means. But how do we, why do we feel the pains of others? Because the other is none other than ourselves. And he or she who does not feel the pain of others is living not only below the human state, but even below their own possibilities, that we are not fully human. To be human is to be attached to the whole of existence. And I, for one, who was the first person perhaps in the West to speak about the environmental crisis when nobody spoke about it uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and in spiritual re uh, sources, not only the pollution of rivers like uh, I'd be written about before I wrote, uh, I want to emphasize that compassion, metaphysically, spiritually speaking, should not only be towards human beings. And it should certainly not only be towards our religion or our family or our town or our streets and so forth and so on. Most people have some compassion. Even murderers have compassion perhaps for the sister living down the street and give her some money. But it must be infinite. There must be no boundary to it. And most important of all is compassion towards all creatures. One of the greatest lessons I think that the modern West has learned from Oriental spiritualities, whether it's Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, or anything else, Taoist, is that there's no completely sharp line between the human and the non-human. I don't mean in the Darwinian sense. Darwinism is a kind of caricature of truth. It's truth inverted about 180 degrees. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about the fact that uh, the value of existence is not only of human beings. We cannot sacrifice everything for the sake of human beings. Nor is it only in life. We cannot sacrifice mountains and rivers for the sake of life in general, they're all intertwined together. That's why when we destroy the salinity of the ocean, so-called non-living water of the ocean, we also affect all those living things in it and destroy them. So this compassion is something which is absolutely essential not for the realization of the truth and for keeping the world going. Without compassion, Human beings cannot survive. We are now observing this before us. We are observing our own suicide because of lack of compassion in the metaphysical sense. Not that there are no compassionate people around. There are a lot of Christians who go and open up hospitals in Africa and they're very compassionate on a human level. They have no interest whatsoever in nature and other creatures because they were never taught that in school. They were never taught that Christianity had anything to say about the sacredness of nature. So compassion in the deepest sense goes back to the metaphysical structure of reality. And in the West itself, in classical texts in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, there were certain philosophers and theologians who wrote about uh, sympathia in Latin, sympathy. Sympathy is very, very profound. Was, they said between all creatures there is sympathy. The vertical sympathy between heaven and earth, every creature on the earth and heaven, the celestial prototype, and on the earth horizontally between all creatures. Sympathia means to feel the pain of others. It gets, again, same word, sim and pathos. Root, its root is the same. And so when we talk about silence and uh, compassion, 
you must understand that this is not a sentimental matter. It is to realize the nature of things. And why silence? Because silence is a symbol of the origin before the cacophony began. And it's more than a symbol. Uh, it's a very important point. Uh, we, could, we could say everything that we say about silence about light, because light and sound are the two fundamental phenomena which we usually make use of in all religious texts to describe metaphysical truths. We don't we talk much less about perfume, although occasionally, for example, in Islamic hadith, the, uh, the prophet spoke about perfume. But usually it's light and sound. And why is it that we always talk about holy silence? We don't talk about holy darkness. Hmm. Because if you talk about the symbolism of light, what corresponds to silence and sound is darkness and light. And that darkness, that darkness is there in metaphysics. Nicholas of Cusa speaks of it in Christian metaphysics. And it's very, very important in both Hinduism and Islam. You have the night of Brahman in Hindu cosmology. I dare not speak about Hinduism with all the great authorities from India here, but I'm a humble student of uh, Hinduism also. I've studied for years at Harvard and reading the works of Kumar Swami and going to India, and a very, very humble student. Never write about Hinduism because I, and that's not my field, but I know this much about it, that according to Hindu cosmology, the world is reabsorbed into the reality of Brahman. And then you have the night of Brahman, in which is just pure darkness. There's nothing. But it's a nothing, which is a no thing, but it's everything. It's, it's not a nothing, it's a everything from which then the next day of Brahman emanates, the next cosmic cycle and all the manmantaras and yugas and so forth and so on. And in Islam, we have the most beautiful image I've seen in any poetry, uh, in Sufi poetry, about the symbols of night, which is called black light. The light, which is, the, is black because of the excess of its manifestation, not because of darkness, but the excess of its glow. And uh, there's this divine poem in Golshan Raz, the secret rose garden of Shabastari, my favorite Sufi poet, along with Hafiz and Rumi, uh, who says, uh, you think of God in the world, is Shabir Roshan Miyana Ruza Tariq, the Persian poem, and illuminated night amidst the dark day. The day seems to us to be luminous. It is really dark, but it's also separation of the divine. And the night appears to be dark, but it is illuminated because it symbolizes the non-manifested. Silence in terms of light rather than sound. But why do we talk about silence all the time? Because we, except great saints, cannot make light, but we can make sound. That's the reason. That's the reason. Uh, and so silence is also very important from a practical point of view, from the way of reigning in, in a sense, the whole cosmogonic process of generation and returning it back to the source, to the principle. And that is why there's always an element of silence in spiritual people. Don't forget that according to every religion, we are here not because of silence, but because of sound. According to Hindu metaphysics, the sound om, we're not here, we would not be here. The book of John says in the beginning was the word. It didn't say the beginning was silence. And the word was associated with Christ. In Islam, it says, kun fayakun in the Quran. God said, be, and there was. So we're here not because of silence. We're here because of divine sound. This is very, very important to remember. And so what is spiritual in every spiritual path is this great mystery that sound, this sound, sacred sound, brings us back to sacred silence, whereas cacophony does not. But we come from uh, silence, but we are in sound. And so it's through sound that we go back to God. And uh, I believe that a lot of Westerners who practice meditation, when it's not combined with an active element, something like japa or dhikr, we have very great difficulty really getting to the source. It's, uh, there's only half of the process. I don't want to uh, give and it directed for others, that's not my business, but uh, you look, when you look at the totality of things, you realize that, as the Sufis say, 
we have come into this world through the Word, and it's by the Word that we shall leave this world. And the Word here, of course, means the name of God, uh, the manifestation of God. And you have exactly the same thing in Christianism in Hinduism. In Hinduism, there's so many uh, references to this. And even in Buddhism, where there's not supposed to be a, a divinity in the sense of Ishwara or Brahman or Allah or something like that, nevertheless, we all know the significance of Nimbutsu, of various forms of ejaculatory prayer, especially in later forms of Buddhism, and Chan and Zen, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Jodhishin, especially in Japan, more than Zen. Zen relies a great deal on silence, but it does have certain forms of ejaculatory prayers. Uh, all of these point to the fact that uh, we, when we talk about silence and compassion, we must understand what the silence is. How do we reach silence? How to do become quiet? And where are we? Uh, why is it that silence leads to compassion? And let me finish. My time is up. Uh, I was supposed to speak 40 minutes, and it's exactly 40 minutes. Uh, I, uh, I'm an MIT graduate. You know, I have to be very precise in, in, mathem in mathematics. I'm not one of the wandering dervishes who speaks for four hours instead of four, four minutes. <laughs> We are in this world because the primal silence was broken by the sacred silence itself. Otherwise, there would be no world. But that pri primordial silence, which somehow always remains within the sound of its own creation, had provided for us the means of returning unto it through the divine sound. And one of the concomitants of this is the realization of who we are. And to realize who we are, we must realize that our self is the self of all selves. And this is the metaphysical foundation for all compassion. And so no matter how great a metaphysician one is, how great a thinker, there is no gate to heaven without compassion. There is no blessed soul without silence. Thank you. begin with a chant, as first in Sanskrit and then a translation. <clears throat> Om Vishnu Vatri Purantako Bhavatu Va Brahma Surendro Tava Bhanur Va Shashalakshanota Bhagavan Buddhota Siddhota Va Raga Dvesha Visharati Moharahita Satwano Kampodhyato Yasarvai Sahasamskrito Gunaganais Dasmainama Saravada. The Supreme Reality and its messengers are known by various names in various traditions. <clears throat> but as for me, I offer my worship always to the one going by any name and belonging to any tradition, who is free from attachment and hatred, free from worldliness and delusion, who is filled with compassion for all living beings, and who is possessed of all noble virtues. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Om Peace, Peace, Peace be unto us all. First, let me say it's a great blessing to be here. It's a great blessing to be here with uh, Dr. Uh, Nasser, someone whom I have admired from a distance uh, for some years, known about. Uh, if you haven't read his book, which uh, there's several books of his out here, uh, all of which are very good. The Garden of Truth is a wonderful, wonderful uh, text that I recommend highly to everyone. So I feel honored, really, to be here uh, and at the same platform with uh, such a distinguished uh, uh, man, such a, uh, a man of great uh, insight, great knowledge, great learning, 
uh, it really, I was overcome when I heard that uh, this was possible. I thank very much the organizers who have made this uh, extraordinary event possible. Um, uh, I've heard it said several times, well, you've come all the way from India for this. Uh, you couldn't have kept me from coming if <laughs> once, once I knew it was possible to come. It was, a, it was an honor for me to come. And I thank the city of Louisville for making this possible. It's really an extraordinary thing. I've been to many interreligious events, and I've been to many cities in America and in other countries. Uh, but it's a very unusual thing that a city like Louisville uh, would put on uh, such an event and put it on year after year. So I thank those of you who uh, are here from Louisville. I thank all of you who came from outside for coming. And I thank the organizers for the wonderful work that they have, uh, that they have done. So first, let me say that uh, uh, yay to everything that Dr. Nasser has said, Professor Nasser has said. There's nothing, uh, obviously, if I were to speak uh, on the same to topic as I, w as I will now, I'll say it in different terms. But there's nothing which he said which I would uh, uh, have the slightest, uh, slightest quibble with. Um, so I, I will speak in different, uh, somewhat different terms, but uh, at least from my perspective, and I hope from his, uh, at least from my perspective, it's, uh, it's complementary. I always like, uh, just as a matter of uh, uh, personality, as a matter of temperament, I, I like to work from the terms of a, of a theme that I've been given here, sacred silence and compassion. So let me first uh, address the term sacred. That's the easiest of the three terms. Uh, I can be dispensed with easily, not because it's not important, it's very important, but because it's easy to speak about. It's very common nowadays for people to say that, well, everything is sacred, and yes, that's true. Everything is sacred. But also, everything is secular. Everything is secular to the mind which is non-sacred. That is, to the mind which doesn't see the sacred, Everything is secular. Religion is secular. God is dead. Uh, and everything in the universe is just material, uh, just dead, dull, and sentient matter, that is. And so to the, uh, the person who uh, is spiritually minded, everything is spiritual. There is no secular. Uh, Someone said, let there be light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. <laughs> it's certainly easier to see you this way. <laughs> I can actually see who I'm speaking to, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so to the, uh, to the mind that is able to see, everything is uh, sacred and everything is full of light. Everything... Uh, <laughs> uh, so every, everything is sacred. And uh, uh, so sacred and secular depends on the mind. I would say that uh, ultimately everything is only sacred. There is only the sacred. That, that, is the, that is the truth. But to the mind who doesn't see that, to the mind that's not uh, sensitive to that, then yes, everything is seen as just dull, dead, and insentient. So sacred, everything is sacred if we have the eyes to see it. Silence. What is silence? We can't understand silence without understanding sound and uh, without understanding a special form of sound, which is word. So um, there are different levels of silence. Let's first begin with physical silence. What is physical silence? Physical silence, obviously, is the absence of sound, including uh, human language, but the absence of sound. And uh, physical sound, of course, are just waves, vibrations, that pass through a medium, such a physical medium, such as air or water, or our own voices sound different to ourselves from what they sound to our hearers. Um, nowadays, it's not so long before a person first hears their own voice recorded. But when I was a kid, tape recorders were rare, and I was in the eighth or ninth grade, ninth grade, before I ever heard my recorded voice, and I was shocked. Uh, that's me. <laughs> I don't sound like that. But that's because I hear myself not just through the uh, air, uh, the vibrations I'm making out into the air, but through the bones of my, of, uh, 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 of my head. Um, and so sound is carried through a physical, uh, a physical medium. But sound is more than just vibration. First of all, who, 
is there sound without an ear to hear it? Or better, is there sound without consciousness to be aware of it? Sound is the way that we react to, or what uh, the mind's reaction to vibrations. So unless there is a consciousness that hears sound, there's not really sound. There may be, it's arguable whether they are vibrations or not, uh, without an awareness there to perceive it. I won't go into that argument, but certainly there's not really sound, just as there's not really light, what we know as light and what we know as color, without a consciousness to perceive it. And sound, <clears throat> all sound, even uh, not speaking of human language, all sound is information. If I hear a neighbor running a chainsaw, that gives me information. Because everything in the universe is knowledge. Everything is, everything is prakasha, as it's said in Sanskrit. That is manifesting knowledge, the manifestation of knowledge. And so all sound is knowledge. And word is a special type of sound. Through words, we convey thoughts, concepts from one mind to another. All sound conveys information for those who can hear it. Just as, a, as interesting with dogs. Dogs uh, have such a profound sense of smell. Uh, we think of smell <clears throat> in terms of good smells and bad smells, basically. But for dogs, smells have so much information. That's why when you take a dog for a walk, it stops at the fire hydrant, and it can stay there for five, 10 minutes just uh, sniffing because there's so much information there to be gathered. So for us, uh, sound is full of information, light is full of information, and so it's a universe of, of knowledge. But word is a particular type of a sound, a sound which conveys from one mind to another, conveys thought uh, from one mind to another. And so the absence of physical sound is what we normally think of as silence. Let's all be silent, then everybody knows, says, okay, now we're not going to talk and we're not going to make noise. And, uh, 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 that will be our experience of silence. And so uh, silence for most people means physical silence. But as Dr. Nasser beautifully said, that's not the most important part of silence. We can fetishize silence, and as soon as we do, then we hear a sound like we just heard. We say, well, let's all be quiet, and then suddenly uh, all kinds of sounds start happening, and then we get irritated and frustrated, and we try to control the environment so those sounds don't come. Uh, so sound, or er, silence is much more than just uh, physical silence, the absence of physical sound. There are benefits to physical silence, relative physical silence. Absolute physical silence isn't even possible if you, uh, as long as there is an operating, a mind attached to the ear, uh, absolute uh, uh, silence is impossible. Uh, but some limited silence is beneficial because it gives us a chance to focus on what's going on in the mind. But that's where real silence begins to take place. So uh, the uh, search for silence is really the search for internal silence. And external silence only as far as it helps. But again, it's a mistake to fetishize it, to make it too important in our spiritual lives because we can't control it uh, so often. So the search for silence leads us to the search for mental, mental silence. So mental noise, what is mental noise? Mental noise is the cacophony of thoughts that are within the mind, the thoughts that are going on. As Dr. Nasser beautifully pointed out, uh, thoughts are generally in the form of sound and image, sound and image. According to the uh, Vedanta and to the yoga psychology, there's a point where image and sound divide. There's a place above the ordinary operation of the mind, not beyond the mind, but beyond the ordinary or operation of the mind before sound and image separate where the two are one. But for us, in our normal mental operation, uh, there are image and, uh, uh, and words, concepts. And so mental noise is uh, different from uh, f uh, physical noise. So many people uh, come to people like myself, a uh, uh, spiritual person, a person who's practicing spirituality. I don't make any claims for myself, but someone who's practicing sincerely, trying the best that he can, and says, Swami, I wish I could just tell my mind to shut up. I wish I could find some way to tell my mind to shut up. So that's the silence. That's where silence really begins. When we begin to work with the mind, what is mental noise? Again, mental noise is thoughts, primarily words and images. And mental silence is the relative absence of those thoughts, that cacophony of thinking, remembering, uh, and imaging. That's where the, uh, the practice of, 
of uh, meditation comes in. And also, as Dr. Nasser beautifully pointed out, uh, we can't get there just by killing thought, by saying, okay, I'm just going to kill the mind, I'm going to destroy the mind, or I'm going to destroy thinking, I'm just going to stop thinking. What happens when we try to do that? Uh, one of two things. Either we go to sleep because uh, th uh, the mind is used to activity, or the mind rebels and just spins off into an ending activity, and we get distracted, and we forget we were even supposed to be practicing uh, steadiness of the mind. So steadying of the mind is usually done in uh, one of s several ways. One way is through the practice of mindfulness. Present in all spiritual traditions, it was especially developed in the Buddhist tradition as a science in itself. In other traditions, you see it men mentioned. Christ himself mentions it. He says, watch and pray. Praying is meditating. Watching is being mindful. Watching is being mindful. And so in mindfulness, what you do is you try to establish a steady field of awareness, not focusing on one particular thing, but holding the mind as a steady field of awareness, being aware of whatever arises within the field of your awareness, but holding the, the awareness uh, steady and alert. Another type of another approach to mental quietude comes through focusing the mind, what you could call the yogic approach, where you focus the mind on one thing through japa, that is repetition of a mantra, uh, uh, focusing the mind on a symbol, uh, on a word, uh, uh, etc., uh, even on a physical object, but something to bring the powers of the mind to a focus. That has great value, uh, as does mindfulness. Focusing the mind on one point has great value because all knowledge comes through concentration. Anything that we want to understand the secrets of, by focusing the mind on it, that's the way that we uh, open the secrets uh, to, uh, uh, to nature, internal and external. And so focusing the mind. Mindfulness, focusing the mind, or seeking, seeking. In Christian prayer, for instance, in the, the uh, mystical prayer of the uh, Christians, not just the vocal prayer and so forth, but the mystical prayer is developed by uh, great Christian mystics. You find them speaking about getting rid of words, getting rid of images, and just waiting on God. But that waiting is a seeking. It's, a wait, it's an active waiting. Otherwise, again, the mind just falls asleep. And so in seeking mental stillness, and again, I'll, uh, as I said at the beginning, I like to define terms. That's the way I approach things. I'll come to compassion. Uh, but uh, first, I, I want to deal a little bit more with, uh, with uh, silence and the opposites of silence the opposite of silence. So we try to bring the mind to uh, stillness, but we do that either by focusing or by holding the mind alert as a field of awareness and watching things arising in it, the practice of mindfulness, or waiting or seeking. Waiting and seeking are really two aspects of the same thing. Uh, that is, uh, seeking God in silence and in uh, darkness, waiting for God in silence and darkness, or in the Vedantic tradition, there's a uh, practice also present in Chinese Buddhism, in the uh, Chan Buddhism of uh, China, Chinese Zen. The practice of seeking for the self, that is seeking the source of my awareness. The seeking the source of my awareness. So I'm not going to go into all of these practices. I'm just saying the, uh, that it's an important point to know where do we find silence? Physical silence can only be relative. Mental silence, that's where we seek it. But to seek it, we don't just say, okay, now I'm just going to be uh, silent and let the mind uh, just be quiet. The mind won't do that. It'll either go to sleep or it'll spin off into activity. So something which disciplines the mind, which brings it into a state of uh, silence. There's the <clears throat> second sutra, that is aphorism, of the yoga aphorisms or the yoga sutras. Uh, the most famous of all of the aphorisms on yoga, which is yoga chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the cessation of the modifications of mind. So that's talking about the perfection of yoga. Much of the rest of the yoga sutras tells how you get there, and they give techniques for doing it by training the mind, not just by killing the mind, which you can't do, but by training the mind, for instance, through focusing and other, other methods, seeking and waiting, etc. But Yoga is the cessation of the modifications of mind. And then it says, tada drashtu svarupevastanam. Then, when the waves of the mind have subsided, then the seer is established in its own nature. The seer is what? The seer is the self, which Dr. Nasser was talking about. 
the true self, the divine self, the one self, the self where all of ourselves meet. When the mind becomes still and becomes quiet, then the seer is established in its own nature. You are the seer. I am the seer. Each one of us is the seer. The animal, the conscious animal, any conscious being is the seer. And yet we've identified with the activities of the mind. So that's why silence is important. That's why silence leads us towards the truth, the truth which is also compassion. It's because when the mind is still, then the truth becomes revealed. A very common metaphor which, uh, or simile, which you've all probably heard, is of the still lake. When the lake is perfectly still, you get a perfect reflection. We've all seen beautiful calendars of alpine lakes where the water is perfectly still, and there's a perfect reflection of the trees on the other bank. And sometimes when you first look at it, you're not sure which way to turn the picture, because which is the reflection and which is the reality. So the mind, when it's still, uh, then reality becomes perceived. And then the, the, the next sutra, just to, uh, to complete that thought, is vritti sarupya mitaratra. At other times, at times when the mind is not still, then we are identified with the waves in the mind. And so we seek silence. Why? We seek internal silence, mental silence, so that we can come closer to God, so that we can know the truth. Yes, again, I keep referring because this talk was so rich. I, I really, again, I feel so I was... Uh, if after Dr. Nasser's talk had ended, they'd said, okay, that's the end, I would have been perfectly happy. But uh, they didn't say that, so now I had to get up to say something. But, um, <laughs> uh, but as, uh, uh, the, 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 I, uh, the idea of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, internal stillness, uh, where, where the mind uh, becomes still, and the self, becomes, uh, the self becomes revealed, then that, again, that's what we're seeking in, in silence. There's a, uh, and here we begin to come, I said there are levels of silence. There's physical silence and mental silence, which we've just been speaking about, and then there's metaphysical silence, which is what we're coming to now, metaphysical silence. There's a beautiful verse in the Chandogya Upanishad, one of the ancient Upanishads, one of the older, the Upanishads themselves, the, the uh, major Upanishads are ancient in themselves, but of them, the Chandogya is one of the most ancient. And there, there's a beautiful passage where it says, Dhyayativa, uh, Dhyayativa Prativi, Dhyayativa Antariksham, Dhyayativa Dyaur, Dhyayativa Dhyayantiva Apo, etc. It says, the earth is as if meditating. The skies are as if meditating. The heavens are as if steeped in meditation. The waters, the rivers, the lakes are all steeped in meditation. Uh, the mountains are steeped in meditation. Men, women, and the, uh, the celestial beings are all steeped in meditation. Deva Manushya. They're all steeped in meditation. As we begin to learn to quieten the mind through discipline, then we begin to get to that point where we feel that the nature of everything really is silence. The nature of things are, is, uh, is silence. We begin to feel that everything is steeped in meditation. There was something I used to do as a practice, uh, uh, which I uh, uh, don't have the opportunity right now to do as much, not as often, but I used to do regularly when I was in Hollywood, California, where we have a Vedanta society. I would walk uh, our, near our center is Hollywood and Vine and the Franklin Street and the, the 101 freeway going over uh, the, the, the streets there. I'd walk down from our temple uh, down to this very busy area and just listen to the extraordinary noise of cars and trucks and honking and people talking and so forth and just try to feel, to make a distinction between internal silence and external. Not that I had attained a great, uh, a great spiritual state, no, but it was a practice, a wonderful practice to try to feel that, yes, silence is internal and to try to feel an internal silence in the presence of which the external silence loses its significance. And that's why, again, I said it's not good to fetishize too much external silence. It's not good to fetishize it. Some is helpful, but uh, we can only control so much, and we shouldn't try to, uh, too hard to control it. We should learn to have that internal. And as we begin to develop that internal silence, then we begin to feel that silence is the nature of uh, reality. 
uh, and uh, then we then we begin to feel this that the the earth is as if meditating the waters are as though meditating the mountains are meditating there was a another uh, passage in, a, in in an Upanishad which has been lost there's a, it's only mentioned in a text of Shankaracharya the great Vedanta philosopher who mentions this, uh, this ancient text, which we no longer have the original to. We just know this one little segment. Uh, there was a man named uh, Bashkali who came to ask a great teacher named Badva about the nature of reality. He had heard that reality was transcendent, that reality was beyond time and space, beyond thought, beyond concept. So he goes to this great teacher and, uh, and says, Adhi O oh, revered sir, teach me. Teach me the nature of Brahman. Teach me the nature of the highest truth. And so it says that uh, the, see, the teacher sat there. Dvitiyam, tritiyam, a second time and a third time. He says, teach me, sir. Teach me the nature of reality. And so after the third time of asking him, and still the teacher remaining silent, then uh, the teacher says, I am teaching you. Brumaha, I am teaching you. Upashanto yamatma. Upashanto Yamatma, the, na the name of the self is silence. The name of the highest self is silence. I am teaching you, as again, that beautiful uh, 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 incident which uh, Dr. Nasser himself witnessed, an extraordinary incident. Uh, and so here in the Upanishads uh, that, uh, that is mentioned, there's also another incident like uh, what uh, Dr. Nasser mentioned in the hymn called the Dakshinamurti Stotra, uh, a, great, uh, a great hymn. Which there's a, a verse in it which uh, begins, Ascharyam Bhattataror Mule, Guru Shishyavridha Guru Yuva. How wonderful, seated under the banyan tree, there's a teacher who's a young man, and seated around him are elderly disciples. The teacher uh, teaches in silence, Gurus Dumonum Vyakyanam. The teacher teaches through silence, Shishastu Chinna Samshaya. But the doubts of the students are dispelled forever. That's something that only a great teacher, as the, the great uh, former Shankaracharya of uh, Kanchipuram uh, that Dr. Nasser met, only a great teacher like that can teach in that, with that type of silence. But those who can teach in such silence, just their very presence is a great teaching. That's the type of silence that we want to attain. We want to approach it from where we can now. And in spiritual life, one of the things to know is what is our eventual goal and how do I work to get there? How do I get from where I am now? And so we begin where we are now, but we need to know where it is that I want to go. And so that's where we want to, want, uh, to go. There was a great uh, uh, king in Indian lore who asked his ministers and the wise men of his kingdom to teach him the knowledge of the self, to teach him how to realize the self that is the, the divine, uh, the infinite self, the one self of which we all are part, where our being merges into the being of the divine. So he asked, and the different uh, people taught him different things, but he couldn't get it. He couldn't get it. But he had real hunger. It wasn't just an idle, uh, speculative wish of his to understand something. He really wanted to experience this uh, deeper reality. And so for years he went on asking people, trying what he was taught, one day it said that God took compassion on him, and God appeared before him in the form of a gardener, taking the form just of an ordinary uh, humble gardener that the king, of course, didn't recognize. And the gardener was there trimming the plants in the garden. And the king came up to him and asked the gardener, uh, oh, uh, gardener, please hand me a rose. And so then the gardener stood up and said, stop. And the king because of his years of practice, he was ready. When the gardener, who was really the divine in hu appearing in human form, said, stop, suddenly the, the king said, stop. OK, I stop my body. But no, the vital force within me is still flowing. Stop the, the erratic flowing of the vital force. But no, he said, stop. Let me stop the mind. And so he, uh, he, he brought the mind to stillness, which he could do because of his years of practice. And he went on stopping everything until he attained to the highest silence, and there he realized the highest truth. So again, that's, that's the silence there that we want. We may, it may not be accessible to us now, but if we know that's where we're going, then we begin to look in the right places. 
there's a, another Vedic passage, an ancient Vedic passage, before even the Upanishads, in the very oldest part of the Vedas, uh, which says, uh, let me chant it for you, and then I'll uh, translate it. It says, Om Dyo Shanti Antariksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apa Shanti Oshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishwe Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redhi Om Shanti 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 now, Shanti is usually, as most of you know, is translated as peace, but it can also be silence. But let me translate it in the usual way as peace. This says, peace is in the heavens, peace is in the sky, peace is on earth. The other passage that I quoted before was the earth is as if meditating, the sky is as if meditating. But here it's saying, peace is in the uh, heavens, and it's really not is in, but peace is the heavens, peace is the sky, peace is the earth, peace is the waters. Peace is the plants and the trees. Peace are the celestial beings. Peace is the nature of truth. May that truth, real truth, be with us all. That's the uh, uh, translation of that uh, particular prayer. And so again, that's uh, the peace that we want. As we begin to even approach it, one of the beautiful things about spiritual life is that long before, when we're still ordinary people strive, striving and struggling to get somewhere on the spiritual path, we begin to see the distant mountains. We begin to see the lay of the land. And we, beget, we begin to understand things that uh, we can't yet experience fully, but we begin to see the lay of the land before us. We begin to get glimpses. Uh, and so one of the things we begin to see at that time is what is the nature of sound? What is the nature of sound? Si sound is silence itself. Sound is made out of silence. It's like dropping a pebble into an ocean of silence, and the waves are what we call sound. If we begin to get even a glimpse of that, then the contrast between sound and silence goes away for us, or it begins to go away for us. We begin to see through the, the dichotomy between sound and silence. We begin to see that sound itself is made of silence. Then our relationship to sound itself changes. Uh, so let me say a word also about word, and then compassion, and then I'll bring it to a close. Because I've spoken a lot about sound, I want to say at least a word or two about word, because word is a very particular type of sound. Again, the way that we communicate. But there are traditions, as again Dr. Nasser indicated, there are traditions, including the Hindu, uh, and the uh, Islamic, and the Christian, uh, and the Jewish uh, traditions, the Kabbalistic tradition, which say that creation, one way of looking at creation is that creation has come out of the word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, says St. John. There's a passage in the Vedas that is exactly equal. Not that St. John copied the Vedas, but it reaffirms the truth of it, that you see it springing up in two different traditions in different parts of the world. In the Vedas, it says, Prajapati Ridamagra Asit. In the beginning was God, Prajapati, the Lord of beings. In the beginning was Prajapati. Vag tasya dviti asit. His second was the word, Vagve paramam brahma. And that word is indeed God, uh, uh, God itself, not himself, but God itself, the neuter form. So in the beginning was God, with him was the second, which was word, and that word is indeed the divine itself. And so word is also something that we our problem is not words. Our problem is too many words. Our problem is not sound. Our problem is the misinterpretation of sound and making too much sound. Uh, the problem with words is that we've forgotten the meaning of words. As I like to say, we know we're in trouble when Coke is the real thing. <laughs> then we're, we're, in, we're in serious trouble. <laughs> So our problem is the use of words, and the misuse of words, and the abuse of words. It is out of the word that creation has come. And so the word that comes out of silence, that's the creative word. In the Hebrew part of the Bible, the Torah, in the book of Genesis, and the Old Testament as Christians know it, it said that uh, God said, let there be light, and there was light. It doesn't say that God went and mixed up chemicals in the laboratory, 
poured out of a, a test tube uh, the first uh, ray of light. No, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That means that God's word is creative. And so, as, again, as Dr. Nasser referred to, the sacred word Om, this, uh, the most sacred word of Hinduism and the most universal Hindu, uh, symbol of Hinduism, which was used by, not only by the Hindus, but then by the Buddhists and the uh, Sikhs and the Jains. And there's no reason why any tradition couldn't use it uh, because it's there for anyone's use. It parts, it's part of the universal heritage of humanity. Uh, the sacred word Om is said to be the first creative sound out of which everything else has come. So when we know the meaning of language and we know the significance of language, all words come from that divine source. There's a beautiful idea in Sanskrit grammar which says that the true meaning of every word, because Sanskrit grammar, everything in India had a spiritual foundation. Grammar also was considered a spiritual uh, philosophy and even a spiritual path. It said that the true meaning of every word is God. The true meaning of every word is Brahman. The true meaning of every word is the highest spiritual truth. What does that mean? It means that everything that we can name is, and isness belongs to the divine. The divine is the being that is. The, the divine is I am that I am. Uh, that, is, uh, that is the nature of the divine. And so when I say this podium, I'm pointing to something with, which is. I'm saying this is. And so its first meaning is the divine. And secondly, it's, it's manifestation, the divine being manifesting as a podium. When I say a person's name, the first thing is the spiritual reality uh, which is represented by that name. Secondarily, the individual person. And so the meaning of every word is primarily the divine, secondarily a particular object. So again, if we understand the meaning of words, then uh, the contrast between silence and words is not uh, what it what's, once was. Let me read two short passages, then I'll say a word on compassion and then conclude. One is from a Sanskrit grammarian, and he says about the practice of spirituality from the standpoint of word. He says, taking his stand, that is the spiritual aspirant, taking his stand on the essence of word, lying beyond the activity of breath, that is taking the word, tracing the source of word back. When I'm speaking, where does that word come from? I try to uh, seek its source back in my consciousness. Taking his stand on the essence of the word, lying beyond the activity of breath, resting in oneself with all sequence in the words eliminated. There's a sequence of sounds that make up a word. It's said that when we go beyond the physical and mental aspect of speech, we go to a point where there's not a sequence in, in the sounds. After having purified speech and after having rested it on the mind, after having broken its bonds and made it bond free, after having reached the inner light through this process, the aspirant with his knots cut becomes united with the supreme light. So again, seeking the source of word, we take it back to silence and we find its source in the divine silence. And let me read a parallel passage that's even more beautiful, even more expressive from Al-Ghazali, the great uh, uh, Islamic uh, saint, the Sufi saint. He says, let the seeker sit alone in some corner. Let him see to it that nothing save God, the Most High, enters his mind. Then as he sits in solitude, let him not cease saying continuously with his tongue, Allah, Allah, keeping his thought on the name of God. At last he will reach a state where the motion of the tongue will cease. Again, you remember Bhartri Hari, the grammarian I was uh, quoting before. He says, actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't Bhartri Hari, but one of his commentators. He said that uh, they would go beyond the, the level of the breath with the, with the word. So at last he will reach a state where the motion of his tongue will cease, and it will seem as though the word flows from it. Let him persevere in this until all trace of motion is removed from his tongue and he finds his heart persevering in the thought. Let him persevere until the form of the words, its letters and its shape, again, the same as what I was reading before, is removed from his heart, that is the sequence. And there remains the idea alone as though clinging to his heart inseparable from it. Nothing now remains but to await what God will open to him. If he follows the above course, he may be sure that the light of the real will shine in his heart. So again, tracing word back to its source, its source in the divine. So again, if we, have, if we learn the meaning of sound and if we learn the meaning of silence, if we learn where to seek silence, 
if we learn uh, uh, all of this, and we begin to find that yes, silence is the nature of uh, silence is the nature of reality. Uh, silence is the nature of everything. That within everything, the silence is already present. It's not something we have to create. But then our our relationship to sound changes, and our relationship to word changes as well. And finally, compassion. Compassion is, I really don't have anything to add beyond what Dr. Nasser said, but let me just say so that I will say something about it too to complete the talk. Uh, compassion uh, uh, is not, as he so beautifully explained, is not sentimentality. So it's not just uh, good, uh, good feelings. And it's certainly not looking down on someone and feeling sorry for them. Oh, look at the poor wretch, they're suffering, let me do something, uh, throw them a bone or give them something to uh, help them out. No, that obviously is not compassion. Compassion is the feeling of sameness, the feeling of the pains of others and the joys of others as my own, feeling the experience of others as my own experience. What is the value of that? What is the value of true compassion? What's the value of doing that? The value is that that's reality. That is what reality is, because there is no separation. There is no ultimate separation. It's the feeling of separation is being enclosed within this ego self, which is the source of all of our problems. And when we can overcome that, then we find that, uh, that uh, compassion is not something that we're told to do because we're supposed to do it. It's not something that, well, is good for you. It may hurt, but it's going to be good for you. It'll form character. No, it's something which is good for us because it's truth. It's something which is good for us because it's our own nature. It's something that's good for us because once we begin to open our hearts, the sense of ego becomes porous, and we begin to let the world outside be included in our self, sense of self. When our sense of self begins to expand out and include the rest of the world, then we are the gainers. We are the gainers because we become large. Not the ego, but our real being becomes large. As long as we're this little self enclosed within the, the ego, then we're threatened by everything. As we become large, as we learn to include the world within our sense of self, then we become uh, uh, closer to truth, we become large, and we find out what true and lasting and uh, 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 secure joy is. I feel like an interloper uh, with, with, with my cacophony to follow with so many wonderful sacred words that evoke so much silence and stillness in us. Uh, well, I'm just an unworthy aspirant and I'm deeply grateful uh, for the words of wisdom that we have heard from you. And I just sort of sit here with a prayer that being the middle of the sandwich that it all gravitates towards me and I somehow <laughs> assimilate this intuitively and, and, and subliminally. Um, my question really was that um, as, as two eminent people who uh, embody many of the aspirations of what you, what you refer to and what you describe, uh, for us in samsara, um, we struggle with our notions of happiness and for us, you know, the aspiration of the path, uh, usually in, in the words that we are able to use, manifest and well, we want to be happy and, and not be unhappy and to avoid suffering. So what are the unique characteristics or, or qualities of uh, someone who has achieved uh, sacred silence or enlightenment or whatever phrases or words that one might use. Uh, what are the qualities? What happens? What is the experience? Uh, how do we identify it? In what ways does it manifest itself? As everyday beings, what can we hope to reach? What can we aspire to? How does it express itself? What are the unique features of it? Yes, you need yes it's a question for both of you. <laughs> Uh, your question has really several responses. The human beings who reach the highest levels of what you call holy silence, 
who do not manifest this, and you will never find out. That's not their function. It's to be, and that's it. The other human beings whose function it is to manifest that in this world, and your question really pertains to the second category. Usually people like that, first of all, there's a kind of certitude in their word, an attraction in their word. Mm -hmm. It confirms a famous Persian proverb that a word that comes from the heart settles upon the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow the words, even the sentences, the grammar may be similar to someone else's, mm -hmm. but it settles upon one heart. There's an inner attraction for it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, there are usually people who have a perception that goes beyond the immediate mm -hmm. perception of things. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of them are great metaphysicians necessarily, but they're spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. The spiritual being always sees everything in divinus. Mm -hmm. There's the perfume of the sacred in everything, as he just mm -hmm. pointed out in another context. Mm -hmm. I'm, I agree completely with what you said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, there is such thing in the secular world, otherwise we wouldn't be where we are. But for the spiritual person, the perfume, the sacred is present there. Mm -hmm. So he's able to present sometimes even ordinary everyday experiences mm -hmm. in another light, mm -hmm. another light. There are so many stories of uh, great Sufi teachers walking in the street in the bazaar or something like that with some of the disciples. Mm -hmm. And you know, a man comes along with a donkey and passes by and nobody knows it, but he, he has a spiritual lesson mm -hmm. with his disciples because of that. And a great teacher is not one who only speaks about pure philosophical metaphysical ideas, mm -hmm. but is able to express the deepest meaning mm -hmm. in the most everyday uh, common experiences. Eating lunch, drinking water, walking in the street. Uh, one can expound the deepest truth from anything. I once had a great teacher in Iran uh, who was very funny. He said, so and so, you said all these years you've studied and so on and so on. If you can explain the whole of metaphysics, through eating Persian rice, then you reach uh, some station. So it's a kind of uh, what is so much emphasized in Zen, a kind of extraordinary ordinariness. There's no haughtiness involved in it. There's a humility that's always involved in it. It's very, very different from someone who just talks about these things. There has to be in that person a presence. And there's in all human beings a sixth sense of sensing the presence of the sacred. It may be weak. Some people are not, have, don't have good ears for music. Some people have wonderful ears for music. But the ear is always there somewhere. <laughs> and there must be that sense of presence, without which what you say has not become actualized. Anybody can pick up the book and read the Chandrago Upanishad and repeat it like him, that remarkable passage, beautiful passage you quoted. But to understand what it really means to be there, that's quite something else. And there's always an existential effect to sapiental knowledge that is realized. Uh, absolutely, there is no perfume without aroma. That's impossible. There's no candle that does not cast some light, which does not negate what I said at the beginning, that there are some creatures in the world whom God has chosen completely for himself, in a sense. And they are there, but we really do not know. But they play a cosmic role. They play a role in the equilibrium of the world, which is another story I will not get into. Swamiji, uh, it's in, in the Vedanta tradition, and Swami Vivekananda taught us that, uh, or, or brought once again to the fore, that depending on your mental disposition, you had different paths, bhakti and karma and raj yoga, et cetera. Uh, and I, I hear so much about complementarity. Um, surely there are different parts given to different people in terms of maybe the, the, the social context in which they live, their mental dispositions, they have the need for different mental diets in order to reach this goal. So do you see any Differences. Well, I, differences is too emphatic a word, but let's see nuances uh, in terms of uh, the Sufi articulation of the path and the aspiration and elements in Vedanta. Yes, that's a good, uh, good question. And uh, I, 
I don't see a uh, difference, I do see a nuance, and that's why you can read a Sufi text and recognize this is a Sufi text, and you can read a Vedantic text and recognize this is a Vedantic text. Otherwise, uh, if they would sort of melt together and you wouldn't know what you were dealing with. <laughs> and of course, it's more than, just the, uh, more than just the terms. But I find, I have to say, with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the Sufi, and let me back up and say that I uh, deeply appreciate what Dr. Nasser said at the very beginning, that it's a danger to separate Sufism from Islam. It can't be separated from Islam. Uh, so when I, when I use the term Sufi, let me affirm uh, that, I, uh, that I'm speaking of uh, the mystical dimension of Islam only. Uh, that when I read a mystical Islamic uh, text, uh, that there's a, there's a, I have not yet found a uh, passage where I say, no, that's not true. No, this is wrong. <laughs> I find it uh, an expression of truth. And what is inspiring to me and helpful to me in my spiritual life is that when I read it, I find that, oh, that's, uh, that's uh, a new way of looking at this the truth that I had been looking at from a different perspective. The reason why two eyes give us uh, a depth of vision is because of the slight angle between the two, uh, two eyes. We, uh, uh, it's, it's the distance between the two eyes that allows me to see depth. And so when I can see in a tradition like the Sufi tradition, uh, which has so many parallels with uh, uh, Vedanta, or Vedanta has so many parallels with it, uh, then it, it, it's an experience of beauty for me, and, and, and not, uh, not an experience of contrast, and certainly not difference. Yes, yes. One of, let me just add one other thing, that uh, one of my teachers, a Hindu uh, Swami, of course, uh, never been outside of India, but he told me many uh, years ago that uh, you should read uh, the lives of Sufi saints and the lives of Christian saints, that you'll get great uh, value from both, and that, uh, that is true. But may I add a point to this? Uh, I think it pertains very much to his order because it belongs to the Ramakrishna order. Uh, if you're going to talk about nuances, uh, especially in later history of India, when Ramanuja came upon the scene, the distinction between Janana and Bhakti forms of spirituality became much more distinct in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're more bound together in Sufism. Mm -hmm. You don't have pure Bhakti Sufism, mm -hmm. like you have pure Bhakti Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, even pure Janana forms of Sufism have a Bhakti element to them, if you're going to take a Sanskrit term. It was the great Ramakrishna who tried to reintegrate these in the context of Hinduism again. And his view from that point of view was very close to Sufism, and he knew it. He had said that to some of his colleagues and friends because, you know, for a while he was practicing Sufism in Bengal. And, uh, so this is an interesting point of comparison between these two great traditions. Yes, that's very true. In fact, in, in, in the case of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, of course, that he actually engaged in the practices uh, of, of, the, of different traditions. Uh, yeah. uh, as much Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, yes, all three. Uh, as, as much as for his own education uh, and his own growth and understanding, as uh, even though he is regarded as an avatar, but I believe uh, equally to send out a signal uh, to the rest of the world that he did this in in in, in public, uh, albeit outside the temple precincts. That look. <laughs> well, I, I would I would uh, uh, change that a little bit mm -hmm. and say that, uh, as the Holy Mother Ramakrishna's wife said that Ramakrishna didn't do that with, uh, with any idea of, uh, uh, of teaching others. It was a spontaneous uh, love for, uh, for the divine in any way that it could be experienced. And so the, the teaching was there, the example was there and is there, and the example is there. But uh, I don't think that there was, uh, not that you were saying it this way, but I want to make this uh, distinction, uh, that there was no premeditation that I'm going to teach this to the world. That was, uh, that was uh, distinctly absent. There was just this idea that Oh, God can be experienced in this way too. Let me throw myself into it. At the, at, at, at the practical level for, for uh, those of us who are exposed to a wide diversity of uh, religious, philosophical, and spiritual traditions, um, and, and sometimes we naturally gravitate to one as opposed to or instead of uh, the other, uh, and and we, we also see in, 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 in terms of the secular uh, an attempt to take little bits from different traditions uh, you know, 
through a, a brand of spiritual tourism where you collect artifacts and, and, and bits and pieces of practice. Um, uh, surely there is, there is a, a value, and, and you mentioned that you know, these are traditions that have survived thousands of years, and, and, and that is the demonstration, um, you know, more than anything else, that it works, and there is a value to it. Um, so, in, 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 in today's era, uh, how dynamic, how necessary is it for spiritual traditions to evolve, to meet the, 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 the current predicaments and needs of aspirants uh, without diluting the core uh, so that they can respond to contemporary uh, issues uh, that come up? And, and traditions such as the, the Chuso beautifully articulated and, and the more metaphysical aspects of Vedanta, of course, rise above it. And so you go into a much larger uh, metaphysical realm. But for us to access that, you know, the points of entry are still pretty mundane. And, and so how do we navigate that journey? That's a very, very cardinal question. When Jawaharlal Nehru was still alive, he was the Prime Minister of India, the Indian government decided they wanted to change Muslim personal law in India, not Hindu personal, Muslim personal law. And they faked a very big conference, international conference, major scholars all over, all of whom came to confirm that it would be all right to change Islamic personal law. And unfortunately for India, they also invited me. And I and did the whole thing, and that's what Nehru had his heart attack. He was sitting right there in the front row. Oh, really? Uh, and Mr. Indira Gandhi took him out and died a few months later. Not that I caused his death, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I said at that conference was that if we have to change with the times, what do the times have to change with? Uh, yeah. The notion that we have to change the religions of the world in order to conform to the so-called realities of everyday life or our times forgets the fact that upon what principles should society itself change? What determines the times? This is one of the greatest errors of the modern world from the point of view of someone like myself who's a traditionalist. We reject all the errors of modernism, going back to the Renaissance. The primacy of rationalism over real intellectual understanding of reality, individualism over the universal, and so many other things about which all the traditional writers have written. We believe that uh, the great religions of the world are a gift from heaven. And uh, the world is to be made in conformity with them, mm -hmm. not they with the world. Mm -hmm. Having said that, however, that, that is, square is always square. You cannot reform a square. Mm -hmm. Every square cannot evolve into a better square. That's absurd. <laughs> Much of modern thinking is pure absurdity, pure sophistry. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside, mm -hmm. the fact that God has willed that these religions are still around, and God has also willed to have a humanity that we have before our day today. Either those religions are no longer relevant to this humanity, or they're relevant, but this humanity doesn't need religion and it's going to do something else, it's going to disappear, it's going to die out. There are several possibilities. One is that we're at the end of the world, which is, of course, a very strong possibility that Hindus, Muslims, Christians, many according to their own scriptures, believe that we're not far away from that. I don't want to get into theological discussions now. But one is that, therefore, the people don't follow religion, and all the religions themselves predict it. It's the book of John, the end of the Quran, and Hadith, and so forth and so on. Of course, uh, all these Hindu texts of the third century, the Puranas, and you know much better than I do. Uh, the second possibility is that as long as these religions are alive, God wants to keep them alive. And therefore, they must have the efficacy because God's mercy will not allow humanity to exist without any path of salvation, but still have the efficacy for those human beings who live at the present moment. And I believe that all the great uh, spiritual paths are given by God as creative plasticity to be able to apply themselves to no matter what time, no matter what place. Mm -hmm. You can practice Sufism right here in Louisville, as you can in Me Mecca, in fact, is the most difficult place to try practice because of these the heathens who are ruling over there, but that's, I won't get into that discussion. <laughs> but uh, I cannot avoid uh, saying something like that when there were a hundred-story building next to the house of God, what can one say? But uh, any other Islamic city, uh, you can practice Sufism anywhere, not by diluting it, but by applying it to the particular human condition in which we find ourselves. 
In the old days, you know, it would take you about two hours to go with your donkey from your house to the bazaar or place of work or the mosque. You had two hours to pray on the way. Now you're stuck in 495 traffic around Washington where you have to curse the devil and so on and so on to get out of it. It's very hard to keep control your anger. So obviously it still takes two hours, of course. It's, I mean, <laughs> the speed has not improved, but you're in a state of anger and frustration all the time. So you need other spiritual means. You're not relaxed as you were going slowly. You dunk your horseback in some Indian or Persian city. So the conditions, yes, have changed. But as far as I know, the great uh, traditions that have kept alive, not only Sufism and Islam, certain path of Hinduism, Buddhism, even Hizikas Christianity, in the Western Christian tradition, most of the spiritual path died out. Merton was trying to revive it in uh, Catholicism, of course. Not the completely died out, the very difficult. In all of these traditions, it is possible to apply it. To, I'm not hopeless, and I tell this to you from experience a person who's not only a scholar of these fields, I have something to do with them, immersed in it, and I've seen it practiced by people as different as uh, children of divorcees from San Francisco to the son of ulama in Cairo and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And that can happen, and I'm sure it's true of other traditions. The fact that he's sitting here mm -hmm. is itself that he is not uh, born into the Hindu caste system. Mm -hmm. He is a Westerner. He's entered into the Hindu spiritual world. This would not have been done a thousand years ago. Hinduism would not have permitted it. It's a kind of, kind of divine compensation. And that, that brings with it tremendous danger because it brings with it the possibility of caricatures, distortions, false gurus, uh, false eclecticisms, which are one of the great problems of our world today, in which, as you say, you take a little bit here, a little bit here. You're making yourself ultimately the god or the prophet. <laughs> without saying so, that so-called guru is now the prophet because he's decided to choose this part of Hinduism, mm -hmm. this part of Islam, this part of Christianity. And that, I think, is total nonsense, very dangerous, demonic. It's a satanic thing, more than much something satanic. Because if, as Ananda Kumar Swami said, all paths lead to the same summit. You cannot jump from one path for two feet and then go to the other path and jump back again. You'll never get to the summit. And post, most likely you'll fall down and break your neck in between. So we're in a world in which the tremendous danger of pseudo-spirituality is mm -hmm. now echoed back into the Oriental world. Mm -hmm. It first echoed back into Japan, mm -hmm. which was the most modernized Oriental country, society after the Second World War. We had began to get pseudo-Zen. Mm -hmm. You had Zen, anti-Zen, pseudo-Zen. Mm -hmm. Then it came in your country, in India. <laughs> All the pseudo-gurus and so forth began to appear. Now it's appearing in the Islamic world. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, they're now fake Sufis. California Sufis have migrated to Tehran. Uh, you know, if I can use such an expression. So we live in really very, very difficult times. Uh, you're right. You put your finger on a very important issue. Um, you know, there may be other forms of uh, uh, less sacred sound invading us, and different kinds of light illuminating us. And in case you're wondering what I'm pointing to, is that they are preparing for a party behind that screen. <laughs> and uh, we have assured them that, uh, uh, or, or that we will try and, and work around their imperative that we conclude at 5 o'clock, and that's just five minutes away. But we will carry on till we're overwhelmed by different kinds of sound and light. Uh, so may I sort of throw open the, the floor for any questions uh, that you might have of either uh, speaker. And if you raise your hand, I, I'm, I'm what promised that the that light that kept speaker, turning on and off? That's what was happening. They oh, were, I see. Good. They, they were, on they the were light counting so we down could, and preparing. We could see the face of those who asked questions. That makes a great deal of difference. Ah, yes, yes, it does. Well, There's a lady there at the back. Uh, okay. Test. Okay. So I'm not real clear on my questions, so maybe you could help me formulate it. But I'm a healthcare. I work in healthcare, and I want to know how you can discriminate between pseudo caregivers <laughs> and authentic caregivers, like from the place of compassion versus the place that feeds the ego and does that even matter in the end result of caring for someone in medicine? Does that make sense? I well, I question. think the question was that how do you distinguish 
between a caregiver who is coming from a genuine position of compassion and someone who is doing it uh, in, in a pseudo fashion or, or with an ulterior motive. Perhaps he would like to answer. <laughs> I can, or I'll, uh, I'll answer, but you go first. Okay, I'll, I'll attempt. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, somewhat similar, I'd say par parallel to the situation in spiritual life between telling, uh, between a true spiritual teacher and one who is a, um, a false prophet, a, 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 a pretend uh, a prophet or pretend a guru. Uh, that's a, that, that's a uh, problem in the spiritual life especially in the modern times, as Dr. Nasser indicated a few minutes ago, it's a particularly modern problem. Uh, uh, and it's also a, a special problem in the health-giving world now with alternative me medicine, which I am a firm believer in, and I use alternative medicine when possible. So I, it's not a criticism of alternative medicine. It is a fact, however, uh, that, uh, as we say in America, the situation is buyer beware. Uh, because uh, even some uh, organizations which uh, authenticate uh, practitioners of certain modalities of, uh, of, uh, of uh, caregiving, uh, even they sometimes are not, uh, are not uh, trustworthy. Uh, so the first thing is that we have to, if it's, the question is about myself as a caregiver, I have to be totally honest, uh, just as, as a spiritual person, to claim enlightenment on my part when I don't have it, uh, that's a terrible, a terrible thing, because you're in spiritual life. It's even worse than in the medical field, because you're uh, playing on people's deepest hopes and fears. In the medical field, you're playing on people's hopes for physical life and death, which also is very, very important. So we have to, the the practitioner has to be uh, extremely careful, extremely honest about what they can do, what they can't do, uh, to know what they've been trained to do and what they haven't been trained to do. Uh, if we're going to someone and want a treatment, then we have to be care very careful uh, about the person that we're going to. I'll stop there and uh, you please. I'll just add this one word, that you have two very different problems that the lady really alluded to. One is the technical know-how of taking care of the sick. You might have a very good intention to have compassion, but give the wrong medicine and the patient dies. Yeah. This must be distinguished from the intention of being compassionate. Yeah. In fact, the caregiver could have no interest in spiritual compassion whatsoever. She's making a living. It might be baking bread or being a lawyer or something else, except she's doing this. So they could have not a zero or even negative spiritual effect because the intention was not to be compassionate, but it's just her profession. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. other, that's the other side of the coin. And on the side of a person who wants to be compassionate in this question of medical problems, it's very important that good intentions are not enough in this case because you're dealing with an aspect of knowledge you might not have, which you may not have. And it must therefore be combined with humility. And this humility involves also uh, being humble in certain beliefs that certain people have about medicine, which will not, might not be based on certainty. Going all the way from tying a knot to a tree or to go into a psychiatrist, everything in between. You know what I mean. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm not criticizing only traditional medicine, but also modern medicine. There are many people have all kinds of beliefs from Christian scientists to this and that. Whether your, this belief is based on certitude upon which then you're going to be charitable and compassionate towards the patient. So it's a very, very complicated field. Uh -huh. And I think the moral, spiritual elements must not be confused with the question of efficacy of the profession that one is uh, practicing. I think an implicit question that has, that, has this, that has come up is that you mention, you know, the aspect of certitude and, and, and certitude of uh, a spiritual teacher. And we have been trained in, in everyday life, uh, or we believe we need to aspire to, uh, a, a healthy sense of self-doubt is, is, uh, is encouraged so that it leaves us open to keep growing and that certitude can be dangerous. Uh -huh, so no. isn't there a fine balance there that where, you know, most, uh, uh, how do I put it, um, most bigots and dictators experience great certitude 
And so what is that fine line between the certitude of a spiritual master? The uh, truth. Uh, but the dictator is as convinced of his truth. <laughs> you know, I mean, Hitler was as convinced of his because truth. Because it was based on falsehood. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, you have to have a certain amount of doubt. This statement that you express, this self-certitude that you're expressing. You're certain that you should have a certain amount of doubt. <laughs> the Quran identifies man's perfection with stages of certitude, mm -hmm. with hearing about the fire, seeing the fire, and being burned in the fire, the three levels of certitude. Certitude is only certitude if it's based on the truth. When it's based on the ego or on falsehood, it becomes very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so the doubt on a certain level is a positive spiritual element. This is different from the doubting Thomas of Christianity or this whole doubt that we have in modern society, so much lack of faith. That doubt is not against faith. It's against the falsification of a crystallization of faith on the wrong level. And that's a human danger. And especially self-deprecation, not taking ourselves too seriously is very important. That's why I said humility. True certitude is always combined with humility. Pride and certitude don't go together. If we have a, if I'm certain of this and I'm very proud of it, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me. All right, the floor. Yes, Lady Um, Excuse me. I'm a person of faith, and I practice my faith, and I recognize other people who practice their faith, but I find that I have compassion towards others who don't have that faith, and therefore my example and the, my treatment of them would reflect the compassion that I have for them, and that I wouldn't... Uh, not recognize them or treat them differently because they don't have a faith. Um, I was just wondering, how do you feel about that? And if I'm, if my journey is to find God or find, uh, let go of ego, I find I'm traveling backwards because I came from God, oh, not God. forwards. And if I'm going back to the silence, which is God, I think then this will I've gone away. I think this will have to be the last question unless we practice what... This uh, is holy silence. <laughs> and, 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 the, and, and the practice of what Swamiji, you know, described is how do, you know, our ability to filter out uh, extraneous sounds. <laughs> and we will be really test. challenged. But uh, uh, perhaps would Could you, you like to... Could you repeat this question? Yes. I, yes. I, I, the it, sound it, came, it, I didn't hear well, the last part. It was right behind me. The, the essence of it was that how do I, if I practice a particular faith, uh, respond to a person who doesn't subscribe to that, to the same kind of faith. I mean, in a nutshell, that was what it was. It was more nuanced than that, but... I'm sure you were all going to say something, but since I've spent a lifetime on this issue, yes, I'll yes. very quickly say a few words. I know we have to stop with this noise very soon. Ordinary human beings were not created to live in a universe of multiple religions. For all of our ancestors, for millennia, they lived within a world in which the religion was their religion. They didn't have to worry about the presence of other religions. There were a few exceptions, like the meeting of Islam and Hinduism in India, the meeting of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity in Spain, but very few exceptions. By and large, this held until our own day. We live in exceptional times. We live in a time when the borders between religions are removed in a certain way. I've, had, I've been teaching for years and years in university in this country and before that in Iran, especially in the West, much more than in the, in the Islamic world. It's very dangerous for a young American student who is a Christian to encounter Islam or Hinduism and Buddhism and consider all these to be infidels and go to hell and remain a Christian. It's very, very difficult. Because we have to either understand the reality of religion in totality or we are in danger of losing our own faith. However, this is not possible for all people. It's very, very difficult. And there are various grades of people. I believe at the highest level, the sages, the saints of all religious communities have to be able to practice an inclusivism which is so inclusive as to exclu include exclusivism. 
an inclusivism that is so inclusive as to include exclusivism. That's very, very difficult. If I sit here with a Southern Baptist who thinks as soon as I die, we'll go to hell, and try to hold the world view, which also includes his exclusivism, that's a very difficult thing. And it's, God really doesn't expect that of everyone. But every religious community today must have religious leaders who understand this perspective and who are able to hold on to it. We have a few examples of that. The patriarch of the Orthodox Church, Bartholomew, this remarkable man who's a very good friend of mine, lives in Constantinople, old Istanbul today. He's what, one like that among the Christians. I've had dialogue with almost all the popes in the last few decades. None of them really held to this view. They wanted to be friends of Islam, but they did not accept Islam as a true religion. I just had a famous dialogue with Pope Benedict XVI, some of them have read that it was, you know, uh, let's love each other in God. I presented a talk before him and he answered on behalf of Christianity. And he always the question of diploma diplomacy, wanted to be friends and so forth. We need more than that. And the great tragedy of our world is that as a result of the advent of modernism in most religions, the movement is going away from inclusivism to exclusivism. I have always said that to my Muslim students, that our grandfathers, when they stood in line of prayer in Mecca or Qom or Damascus, were more open to Christianity than their grandchildren are praying on the line of prayer right now. And the same is true of Christianity, and the same is true of Hinduism. We never had Hindu fundamentalism in the 18th century, 19th century, it's a modern phenomenon. The BJP uh, is, didn't exist at the time of Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. These are all modern things. And this is a phenomenon that is taking place in all religions. And one of the great challenges to those who believe they have a call to make friendship between religions is precisely not to confront not only those who are in other religions who understand them, but within their own religion. As I said, I've been at the front line of this battle for 50 years, over 50 years. It's the end of my life now. But this is one of the most crucial and important issues of our day. I've always said that the only new thing under the sun, if we can record Aristotle, is the plurality of religion and the experience of many people in the modern world. Otherwise, there's nothing new under the sun in the metaphysical sense, really. <laughs> metaphysical sense, nothing understands Aristotle said. Well, Swamiji, since you uh, spent a substantial amount of your time um, training yourself in uh, diminishing the impact of external sound, uh, perhaps you could, you could give us a tip for the next three minutes of meditation and silence that we're about to engage in. Well, that's a, that's a very, very, very big uh, demand to say uh, what to do with the next three minutes of silence. Uh, so I'll only say that uh, let us each uh, enter into silence in our own way and do that which, is, uh, which has become most spiritually natural, uh, natural in the sense of disciplined natural, that which has become a natural discipline to us. Whether it is prayer, well, uh, whether it's prayer, whether it's uh, focusing, whether it's mindfulness, uh, to experience silence uh, each in our own way. And I'll just add one other thing because it just came to mind, uh, a non sequitur, but uh, uh, it's often thought that uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, they pray. Hindus and Buddhists, uh, they meditate. Uh, no, that's not true. Uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims have their, own, they have their own forms of meditation, and in Hinduism and Buddhism, prayer, even in Buddhism, where there's not the, where there's not the idea of a god, uh, there is prayer. It's part of the Bodhisattva's path, is prayer and worship. Uh, and in Hinduism, prayer is extremely important, and it's one of the best ways to learn to meditate. So whether now in the next uh, three minutes of silence you pray, whether you focus the mind, whether you try to uh, seek the source of your being, or whatever it is that you do, let us use the silence uh, to go within. Welcome to the real world. <laughs>